the neighborhood with someone who had went there. Um, so we're a really different set of folks, but we came together around our deep concern of, um, around policing in the city, and particularly how certain communities were being excessively policed, over-policed, hyper-policed, whatever language you want to use, where black and brown folks, poor folks, um, were being inundated, right, with, um, with police officers in their neighborhoods and where the number of stops, as you've probably heard, for all the reporting around stop and frisk this summer, um, had been skyrocketing, right? So I'm going to take you into this neighborhood and into this group, and forgive me, but I'm going to have to move over here because I don't know my slide. No, it's okay. I don't have them all in my head, so I have to look at the screen. So, but it's all right. We'll work it out. All right, so, um, over the last two years, what is now two years, um, we've been working in this one neighborhood, right? Um, and it's a neighborhood that, according to the New York Times, um, has the most physical force used by the police anywhere in the city. 44th Precinct. Uh, it's a neighborhood where it's very common to see police vans, to see the, how many of you live near or have seen police towers? Yeah? They kind of mope run in to a neighborhood. They can um, elevate themselves. Um, we've seen folks come down, literally go to get coffee and pizza, and then all of a sudden the tower goes back up. Um, but it's you know, a regular place. It has street parties and lots of Yankee things because it's right near Yankee Stadium. Um, it's also a neighborhood that has a lot of buildings that are part of the Operation Clean Halls. Anybody know what Operation Clean Halls is? It's um, part of the uh, program that um, was the sort of forerunners around stop and frisk in the city, around um, the, the theory around um, broken windows that buildings and neighborhoods that, that were deteriorating physically were sites uh, of, of potential crime, where those, those, that deterioration was inviting in more crime, and therefore those neighborhoods needed to be um, have more of a police presence, more surveilled, more sort of watched. Right. So uh, during that time, it was also a big war on drugs, and so uh, landlords all around the city were encouraged to um, turn over the security of their buildings to the NYPD for free. So they didn't have to pay for security. In turn, the NYPD was allowed to enter their buildings at, I think it's like 10 to 15 minute intervals, if they so desire, and do what they call vertical sweeps up and down the buildings, meaning that they could stop anybody in a hallway and if that person doesn't live on that hallway, if they're visiting a friend, for example, they can be arrested for trespassing and given a ticket or a summons. Okay? Um, so you see these signs all over. And these are private and public buildings. Okay. So what we decided to do, um, we met some folks, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but we met some folks who, uh, through a lawyer, who were um, fighting some cases. Um, their sons had been stopped. Um, we talked to them about the work that we had done previously with young people in the city called Polling for Justice. I can tell you about that later. But we were interested in thinking about how these zero tolerance policies around and this aggressive policing, how that was impacting a community. So um, the folks that we met through the lawyer, Jackie Yates and Fawn Bracey, introduced us to some friends. Um, we hung out in the neighborhood uh, and basketball courts on street corners, walked around, met other folks, said that we were faculty at CUNY, that we had done a lot of community-based research, um, were very concerned about policing, um, knew this was a neighborhood where a lot of policing was happening, did they want to join us? We had an open meeting at the local library, and um, the, at our, one of our first meetings, um, after folks signed on to work with us, uh, when we started to become a team, um, we decided what the boundaries of our neighborhood was, okay? Um, after we sort of figured out our coordinates, we had to take steps, right, to sort of become this research team. So we shared all of our different knowledges around the table. Folks were coming from really different places, as I said. So uh, Brett and I shared what we know about research and how to design a research project. Um, folks around the table shared their intimate knowledge of how policing was working around uh, in their neighborhoods, what days of the week they didn't let their sons out, what corners they avoided, when they felt those towers were protecting them and when they felt like they were harassing them. Um, we developed a survey that you can see there in the corner that asked people, um, the issues that the, our team was really concerned about was um, police activity, the increase of police activity, um, witnessing it, reporting police misconduct, 
Um, they were wanting to know more about um, folks who are witnessing crime, but but feeling hesitant to actually contact the police. They, there was a real concern about crime actually in the neighborhood. People wanted to know if there had been a change over time in people's experiences of policing and if in their trust of police. They were also concerned that they felt like they had witnessed and they themselves had started to change their own behavior in their neighborhood, right? So they were no longer gathering in public spaces. They were counseling their children to not walk in groups. Welcome. Um, to, um, to wear different clothing. Um, so they were changing their actual, talk about freedom. They were, they were renegotiating their own freedom, right? And voluntarily limiting them in so in hopefully not to get caught up with the, with the criminal justice system. They also really wanted to get at the fear that they were feeling was growing in their neighborhood. Both um, people living there and young people living there, fear of the police, but also what they felt like that the police was afraid of them. Right? that they were living now in a hostile area that didn't used to be you know, in their minds, um, where there was just constant cycles of fear running around. All right. And lastly, they wanted to be able to, to document, so this is a, a bunch of us, um, they wanted to be able to document um, what, uh, what the community was for folks, that it wasn't just a place that was being heavily policed, but that people had good feelings about it, and, and we wanted to be able to capture that. So here's the neighborhood that we worked. We were wanting to produce um, data that would be able to speak back to the NYPD. So that we wanted to create, uh, so we, were, we decided upon doing a survey. And we wanted the survey to be, um, the sampling to be tight enough that it could be in conversation with the NYPD data. Part of our preparation as a research team is that we all learned about all these different data that flow through the city, right? So we studied the NYPD data together. We studied housing data together. We studied education data together um, so that all of us could become fluent in, these, in, in this. And that was a randomly, that star is just a randomly chosen building that we stood outside of as we were sampling, as we were panning out the survey on street corners, right? So these are just images from the neighborhood. Um, it's not just police towers. Every now and then you get a pride flag. Um, these are folks taking the survey on a corner. Sometimes we have lots of folks. Sometimes we just ran across one. But for about six months, we hung out and walked all the streets in that block, handing out surveys. And in the end, we collected over 1,000. All right. So um, this was a participatory project, meaning that not only did we have a team that was largely um, from the neighborhood <coughs> and living the experiences that we were interested in better understanding, but we also constantly went back to the community, to the folks who took the survey, um, to see if we were understanding and interpreting the data correctly. So this is an instance of community data analysis where we took some of the early results, findings of the survey. I think that might be a phone. How is it you? So these are some early findings, that's fine, that we felt were, um, that we wanted to, to sort of get feedback on. So we would walk around the neighborhood and say, hey, you remember that survey you took six months ago? Here's some of our findings. Can you help us make sense of them? Um, eventually, um, after that process, we um, decided that we had three main agendas with our research. First and foremost, we were interested in making uh, sure that people living in the neighborhood, so the folks who had taken the survey, had what they needed in order to respond to what was happening around policing in their neighborhood and around the city. And we wanted folks to be able to start to contextualize, right, that their own personal stories, their friends' stories, with a larger sense of what was going on. Um, we also, our second sort of, yes, two minutes. Oh, good Lord. Okay. So we also wanted to get that information out to other neighborhoods where um, people hadn't been living these, this kind of policing. And at the same time, there was a lawsuit. There were actually three trials happening at the federal court. So Floyd versus the city of New York, maybe you heard, was settled at the end of the summer, right? Um, and that was happening all at the same time. Um, and in addition, there was something called the Community Safety Act that ended up passing, but it, this was early in the summer. And um, so we were doing, trying to get our data to help move all of those agendas forward. All right, so we did town halls and we passed out our report. We ended up producing um, what we call a back pocket report. I'll show you, and if there's anybody interested, you can take some. Um, we went back and forth about how would we get our information out there in a way that people could consume it, right? The folks in the neighborhood we were most interested in 
um, before we started writing academic articles. We wanted people in the neighborhood. So um, we created a poster that could be folded up and put in your back pocket. This is a brainchild of uh, several of my co-researchers. Um, and young people and young men started carrying them around the neighborhood. We tried to give them to John Liu and other mayoral candidates who were a little more successful than he was. Um, I'm gonna, well, I just want to show you from our, the year that we did the survey, there were only eight guns, and actually two of them were somewhat questionable. So six to eight guns were found, and there were nearly 5,000 stops. There were 4,882 stops, right? 0.1% of those ended up in uh, producing weapons, and 1.6 produced uh, drugs or other kind of contraband. So it was very, lots and lots and lots and lots of stops for very little yield. All right, so I'm just gonna tell you a couple other with my probably 30 seconds remaining. Um, ways that we tried to get the data um, into a, a broader conversation. We partnered with, um, we were lucky to get a call from this band called the Illuminator. It's a group of people actually that were born out of Occupy Wall Street that have a van that's outfitted with a massive projector. Um, and he, they had, they, I don't know if anybody saw this around in the last few years where this van projects words on buildings, you know, questions whether banks have paid their taxes, that kind of thing. He had never projected anything about stop and frisk and never had done a movie or anything substantial uh, in terms of length. So he partnered with us and said, what can you do? I've got this van and a projector. What, would you, what do you want to do? And so we took our initial findings and created an open letter um, to the NYPD. So it started with Dear NYPD and it was projected like this, sort of this bat signal on a, on a public housing building right in the neighborhood. So folks were walking home from work and saw this stopped. We had drummers drumming to att attract attention. We had dancers. It ended with a Know Your Rights workshop. But um, all the while, we projected um, data from our survey, right, and statements from the qualitative pieces asserting people's right to their community, right? Sort of asserting there is what, what um, Susan talked about is the scope of, oh, before some of you got here, but uh, about the scope of justice. And in some ways, um, this open letter to the NYPD and some of our other activities have been ways that community <coughs> residents who've been living under the surveillance and, and over-policing have, have tried to assert their own right to be included in the scope of justice, right? On their own terms, not included in the scope of justice and then conveniently pushed into the criminal justice system, but actually, you know, asking for and fighting and arguing for, for um, for inclusion in, um, in, in, in for the same protections and same rights and, and, and um, of, of the city. All right, so let me just give you a few other images. Um, this, these are the ways that we've been trying to be, we were active with the lawsuit. Um, in the far corner here on the bottom left-hand side, those are the two city councilors, Brad Lander and Jamani Williams, who put forth the Community Safety Act. At one of the demonstrations, they took one of our signs, it's not a crime to be who you are, which came from our survey, from qualitative data in our survey, and plucked it from one of our research team members and then held it for the rest of the press conference. They were the sponsors of the Community Safety Act. We've been doing, um, and this is the last thing I'll share, we've been doing all summer long and the beginning of the fall, um, sidewalk science events where we take the data. All of the stuff that we do when we produce these sort of more creative ways are rooted in that survey and in the focus groups that we did with, with uh, people in the neighborhood. So we created buttons with some of the data, both quantitative and qualitative, um, and we set up on street corners. Uh, we printed t-shirts. This was a block party that the Bronx Defenders had. Um, again, quotes from the survey, why do I always fit the description? Um, and we set up in a place where there's a, a fence so that we can hook up all of our uh, materials. We have our reports, we talk people through the research. Community members um, uh, invite folks to join the, uh, an ongoing conversation on these community safety walls that we've been creating, where people take a whiteboard and answer the question, what makes your community feel safe? We don't ask them what would make your community feel safe, we ask them what does make your community feel safe because we assume that this is a functional community where people are building relationships, where there is positive development going on. So, and those things need to be nurtured and invested in, not disinvested in. 
So here are some are that we have now um, oh, close to 100, but here's a little sampling. And here you see people's um, redefining of safety, um, you know, thinking broadly about what it means to be in community with each other, to be sort of protecting the responsible to each other. Um, Michelle talked about, you know, who's accountable to whom. Um, across both our quantitative and qualitative findings, pe people were very interested in policing, wanted police in the neighborhood, but wanted police that could police them with dignity and respect, um, or protect them with dignity and respect. We have a map, this is a map of all the stops that our survey, um, that pe people who took the survey reported, um, and then also that have the NYPD's reports of stops, and people write back to what they think um, so there's an ongoing loop of analysis and interpretation of our findings. And then this is just part of the sidewalk science, and I'll just close out with this. If you're interested later, there are um, these public science shorts that we that use through social media that are little films um, that, again, take the data and try to communicate it in creative ways. Um, so anyways, you can look at those. Great. Thank, thanks, Bodhi. Um, and, um, and the, the final panelist uh, on, on this particular section is um, Distinguished Professor Blanche Cook of History. Um, the, uh, sh her um, presentation is entitled uh, Snowden, Manning and the History of Freedom of Information. Thank you so much, David, and everybody who had so much to do with bringing us all together. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, with you all, and um, all day long there's been so much information. Uh, I'm a little overwhelmed, and I think maybe everybody is a little overwhelmed. And I would like to just say a few things about freedom of information. Um, and my own, I'll just tell you a couple of stories, like um, we all need stories. First of all, it's the tradition that Chelsea Manning Bradley Manning and Edward Snowden are in, are the great whistleblower, we've got to tell you the truth, tradition of people who have been in government service, people who have been in the military, and see things that are truly shocking and horrible. And both Chelsea Manning, who, young man, sitting at his computer looking at really violent, evil, death-dealing acts, and that's not why he joined the military. And he was offended. And so he told the truth. And I think for me, the biggest question is why has Obama declared war on whistleblowers who tell the truth and journalists who report the truth. And this is a very creepy moment in American history. Um, as Stanley said, it's not the first creepy moment. And it's been going on for a long time, maybe forever. Um, I like to think that in this period since 9-11, the, the beasties have hijacked our heritage. And then one pauses, well, what is our heritage? Is democracy any part, really, of our heritage? And this morning, folks went through historical moments um, when, you know, we never had, really, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly. Certainly not during war when the first Espionage Act of 1917, the one that you referred to, was passed. And you mentioned anarchists were deported. Um, publications were suspended and couldn't go through the mail. So the Woman's Peace Party, Jane Addams and Crystal Eastman, and the folks who founded the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary, their journals couldn't go through the mail. And folks were arrested. You didn't mention Emma Goldman. I just want to mention Emma Goldman. I have more graduate students currently working on anarchist Emma than anything else. It's time for anarchism, no doubt about it. Um, I, I like to say my life was an accident. Um, 
partly because my entire life was about sports. And then I had an accident. A boy put a barbell at the end of a mat as I came out of a triple flip and I broke all the muscles and ligaments in my back and I couldn't go to the Olympics and I couldn't major in phys ed and so I had to take other courses. And so I became an historian, an anthropologist, and a government major, all three. Um, not shabby. Not, not, not bad. Shabby. So then I went off to Johns Hopkins where I thought I'd do military history and international relations. And I discovered the world of secrecy. Um, I was in the right place. And not only that, um, I agreed, I didn't agree to go to Afghanistan which they asked me to do. Isn't that creepy? Um, I've always regretted it. Maybe they would have worn cowboy boots, the girls, if I had gone. But the bottom line is, um, I had a syndicated column for a very long time. I wrote my dissertation, let me just say. I wrote my dissertation on Woodrow Wilson and the anti-militarists, all the peace people who were arrested. And one of them, named Crystal Eastman, founded, and you can read my book, Crystal Eastman, on women and revolution. She founded the ACLU. And I just want to say a few hopeful words right now. As we think about where do we go from here, there are a few groups I really want you to know about. The American Civil Liberties Union and the Center for Constitutional Rights. I mean, Snowden and Bradley Manning and um, our friend in London. I mean, does he ever get out for a walk? He No? no? That's he why doesn't. he looks so pale. Yeah. Julian Assange, CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Mike Ratner, good people, they have his case, they, these cases, all of them. Um, but there are many more, and um, I'm bouncing around, but the bottom line is, it, with my syndicated column in 1972, I wrote a column saying all real conservatives should vote for George McGovern, the true heir to Eisenhower's foreign policy. Now Eisenhower, as you heard this morning, gave us his warning, the military industrial complex, and now we have the prison industrial complex and the terror industrial complex. Eisenhower warned us, and the president of Doubleday called me up and said, would you like to write a book on Eisenhower? And I said, no but call my agent, and I hung up. And my agent called me back and said, listen, kid, you don't hang, I was a kid then, you don't hang up on the president of Doubleday. So I had dinner with the president of Doubleday, Sam Vaughan, and he made an offer I couldn't refuse, and I went off to Abilene, Kansas, a dreadful place, which was dry. It wasn't dreadful, really. I mean, Eisenhower was born there in Abilene, Kansas, and he would go to the railroad, watch the trains come in and out, thinking of all the places he could go to get out of there. I really identified. There was no wine with dinner. Um, it was dry. Anyway, bottom line, everything I wanted to look at was secret, was classified. There was nothing I could find out about. I wanted to find out about the overthrow of Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. Not one single document was available. I wanted to find out about the overthrow of the, the very popular nationalist president of Guatemala, Arbenz, 1954. Not one single document was available. And I always say, having been born and brought up in the Bronx, never go anywhere without your gang. I always say that. And it's true. I mean, look at our gang. Isn't this a wonderful gang? I came back to John Jay, and I met with my pals, Jerry Markowitz and Bill Preston, who is no longer with us, and Bill was chair of the history department, and I said, there is absolutely nothing you can find out about anything important um, in the documents. Everything's a secret. Therefore, everything's a lie. Nobody could possibly be telling the truth. Bella Abzug was in Congress. We called her up. She was a friend. And we got the Freedom of Information Act and the Sunshine Law, and we created, and was based here at John Jay for many years, the Fund for Open Information and Accountability, FOIA, Inc. And we did some really, really good things with National, uh, with Lawyers Guild lawyers, CCR lawyers, and 
uh, ACLU lawyers, the best thing we did was a case called the American Friends Service Committee versus Webster, which is the case that revealed, that got released, declassified, the FBI files, including the COINTEL profiles, including my files, and all of us who were activists in the 50s and 60s had files. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt went to Hunter and said, many things are happening in the South. <laughs> Go South for freedom. Every arrest in North Carolina was in my file. Imagine that. And then there was, there's another Blanche Wiesencook who, who did things that I didn't do. So that's in my file as well. Um, but, but her name is Blanche Cook, not Blanche Wiesencook. Anyway, bottom line, here we are in the 21st century. And we have this new reality. The military industrial complex way out of control. The prison industrial complex something new. Now let me pause here. If we had freedom of information, we wouldn't need whistleblowers. If we had criminal justice, and I want to pause here because of the, the presentations. John Jay was created because there were many riots happening in New York. And there was the thought that if we had a liberal arts institution and police officers and firefighters and uniformed personnel came to John Jay, we would have more civility. We would have police officers would be peacekeepers. That's why we were creative. That's why we were created. And I feel John Jay has been deboned. And I feel our responsibility is really to battle the militarization of the police. There is something really wrong with guns in schools. I'm old enough to remember when, you know, the nuns used to beat us up. Um, and the teachers used to have rulers. There was a time when corporal punishment was condemned as child abuse. What is going on here? We don't have rulers. We have machine guns, tasers for children and teachers. And this is beyond the school to prison pipeline. This is beyond the testing punishment society. This is murder, child abuse, horror and we really have to fight it. The other thing is, who the hell is President Obama? He's a constitutional law professor who says somehow it's okay to have targeted killings. Aren't targeted killings murder? What happened to trial by jury? Indictments? I mean, excuse me. So here you have whistleblowers and I could go on and on. And I want to say, I want to, I want to say three things. I want everybody to write this one thing down. Commondreams.org. Write it down. Because commondreams.org is the news site where breaking news from around the country and around the world, Al Jazeera in English, Le Monde in English, Der Spiegel in English, and, the, and really breaking news from around the country and around the world. Plus, there's a group of people who I know and love called VIPs, Veteran Intelligence Personnel for Sanity. And the folks who have been blowing the whistle, former CIA operatives, former FBI operatives, many of the six people, I mean, Obama has indicted more former agents and whistleblowers, including, imagine, Thomas Drake. Do you all know who Thomas Drake is? Do you all? Yeah. Yes? Tell us. OK. <laughs> Thomas Drake worked for the NSA. And he was revolted at the contracts that were going out to private groups doing what the NSA already did. And it was millions of dollars. And he went to his boss and he said, why are we spending all this money having these contractors do all these things, which we do? It is a waste of millions of dollars. 
and nobody paid any attention to him, so he went to the Washington Post, the Washington Post printed it, Thomas Drake was the first indicted under the Espionage Act for, telling, to, to, for talking about the waste of money. VIPs, Ray McGovern is the head of VIPs, the chief operating officer, former CIA senior officer, and he, um, how much time do I have? Let me just give you, uh, if I can, well, if you go on Common Dreams, you'll get it. Um, just, you know, look for, uh, Ray McGovern. Among, among the people, in the VIPs, in addition to Ray McGovern, who's sort of the chair, and Ray Close, is Ann Wright, Colonel Ann Wright, who spent so much time in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and these are people who are veterans. Now, we have here at John Jay a veterans club of over 600 people. And we also have, and I just want to say this for all of you at John Jay, um, you know, if you go into Declan Walsh's office, we are we are feeding our homeless veterans. We have a project to go into the parks for our homeless veterans. And nobody is dealing with the fact that we have something like 10 million homeless Americans, 80% of whom are veterans. I mean, what is wrong with that? There's something really wrong with the creeps who are running this show. And I just want to... Um, tell you what Ray McGovern calls himself. His group is called Tell the World, which is the publishing arm of the ecumenical church of the savior of Washington. Um, and, and his Tell the World is really very powerful. And then he is a member of the steering committee of veteran intelligence professionals for sanity VIPs. So what we need is freedom of information, a restoration of democracy, which means we need campaign finance reform. And I noticed that a lot of these um, cartoons were Google-involved cartoons. There's something really wrong with the fact that those of us who actually use Gmail, I mean, I, should we get off it? Um, he, Google just signed a contract with the Koch brothers mm -hmm. and that uh, lobbyist, what? Sort of Lincoln said right? Oh, God. Um, so we have this, this explosion. I just want to say one thing about Eisenhower. As bad as Eisenhower was on some levels, he really did want World War II to be the last civil war to tear humanity apart. His words. And he also wanted um, national health care program. And nobody is written about a wonderful woman named Ovita Kolb Hobby. Um, I, I keep saying that because I want someone to write about it. Ovita Kolb Hobby. O-V-E-T-A. Kolb, C-U-L-P, Hobby, H-O-B-B-Y. Ovita Kolb Hobby was head of the WAX. That's right. <laughs> she was head of the WAX and Eisenhower, and she was from Texas. And she, had, she was married to the governor of Texas. They had a newspaper, the Houston Post. Um, her son, Bill Hobby, gave me a bunch of papers nobody has seen, so you'll see it in my, in volume three of Eleanor Roosevelt, because it's hot stuff. But Eisenhower said, um, I want medical care for everybody, just the way we had it in the military. Nothing alarming about it. Is that okay with you? And she said, absolutely. And that was really very important, because a lot of people said that she was a Texas racist. And the fact is, Ovita Culp Hobby was a member of the NAACP. And so she really, with Eleanor Roosevelt, Nestor Lape, L-A-P-E, lobbied for a national health care single-payer plan. And the AMA lobbied it to death. And what came out of that in 1956 was the Health Reinsurance Act of 1956, 1957. And that's all we have, you know, it's still health reinsurance, pay. And so we have the most costly health system in the whole industrial world. It used to be the U.S. and South Africa, but South Africa had a revolution. Um, so we have lots of things to do, starting with freedom of information. Who knows? Who is allowed to know? Um, we have covert actions. 
And then we have not so secret covert actions because guess what? Drones can't be that covert and kill all those people. And what are we doing? And this really involves every single one of us. One thing to end with, I should end. One thing to end with is that there's some discussion right now about gods. Police here at John Jay, should our gods be armed here at John Jay? Well, our students are armed. So, I mean, is that a good idea? I think it's a bad idea. But I mean, imagine having armed guards and police in public schools. So there are things really to organize and protest, and we need freedom of information. Um, and we're very grateful to Snowden. And I have to say, a lot of folks start out saying Snowden really is a traitor. And you can tell because he lives in Russia now. Um, there's, what does it mean? Where is the Iron Curtain now? I think that's really the question. Where is the Iron Curtain now? Over to you. We need a movement. <laughs> okay, so we have um, five, seven minutes for questions, comments uh, for panelists. Yeah. Um, these institutionalized atrocities that you guys are all talking about, so like the having guns in our public schools having militarization in the police force, collecting unnecessary information that, that the NSA did, and having this entire world of secrecy developed around our government. Does it, do you think it all relates back to this whole idea that the government believes that knowledge is power, and we need to keep knowledge away from people that we don't want to have the power? Perfect. Anyone want to comment? Knowledge is power. That's why the Testing Punishment Society is trying to keep so many students from going to school and getting rid of students. And all over the country, public colleges are closing. There is a war against public education and a war against teachers and a war against students. And that's our primary battle. Knowledge is power. I just want to say I graduated from New York City High School, and when I graduated, we had no SAT test to get into college. I was fortunate in that I had a, the minimum grade, and that was all I had, to get into Brooklyn College. Of course, I got thrown out for conduct on becoming a student pretty fast. <laughs> what did you do, Mom? Huh? What you do now? Oh, I led a demonstration in the dean's office, but that's you know that's the to handle there. The point I wanted to make was that when Michelle talks about the SAT and te talks about testing and testing and testing, I was free of testing. All I had was a grade point average to get into college, and there were only five colleges in the city of New York at the time when I went there, got ready to go to college. Now, they, they instituted the SAT at the time when there was open admissions so that they could tier and grade the system itself so that they could say to people, you can get into college, but you can't necessarily get into a senior college. You've got to go into a junior college. And you don't necessarily get into the top tier colleges. You can go into the second tier colleges. So the point, obviously, is that part of the surveillance as was said before, has to do with why you're all at John Jay and why some other people are at Hunter. That's a very, very important question. What? Or at Kingsborough. Or at Kingsborough. So in 2008, um, when the economy bottomed out, a lot of private school, private college students transferred to the SUNY system, and a lot of SUNY kids transferred to the CUNY system, right? So because people couldn't afford the yeah. private tuition any longer and people couldn't afford to live away and they moved home. And CUNY, rather than embracing that moment as an opportunity to support all of our students, jacked up tuition and jacked up um, the admission criteria. So what happened is working class students, black and Latino students, and kids who graduated from New York City public schools were much more likely to end up in the community colleges than, it, than in the four-year colleges. So I think, I think there is a question for all of us to think through um, 
What's our responsibility to maintain a public higher education system that's open, that's accessible, that's available, that's diverse, where knowledge is power, where organizing is part of what we do, where science is public, and where you don't have uh, security guards with guns? Do you think that the economic dropout kind of creates this heightened sense of paranoia, where we become more strict with the type of knowledge that we're offering to different people, like increasing tuition rates and, and you know, raising the bar for different you know, levels of people that can attend these colleges? So on my most conspiratorial days, I will tell you that I think that this has to do with privatizing education privatizing K through 12 and public higher education. Um, and privatizing not just in terms of corporate influence, but shifting who gets to be educated and who gets debt, who gets education on a MOOC, who gets online education and who gets real faculty, who gets um, buildings and, and books and opportunities and uh, who's doing online courses at two in the morning. You know all those online courses that are being sold to particularly to communities of color? You know, you have three kids, you have four jobs, take a master's at two in the morning. Um, the, the highest debt rates there are for women of color, right? So those, those are getting sold to particular communities. So there's an economics behind, there's an economics, but there's also what are we teaching, who are we teaching, who, who do we want to be serious thinkers? and who do we want to just be filling in the bubbles. The fact that you all get to hear this, these faculty speaking truth at John Jay, you, you might not know it's such a gift, it is such a gift, right? This is not the kind of conversation that you're getting probably in a lot of your classes. You're not hearing it in a lot of other places. The fact that Dave and other folks pulled this together is so important. The fact that you're getting histories and contemporary work, which is an invitation for you to imagine what's your role in shaping today and tomorrow and in securing a public institution that is intellectually and politically available. That's really, that's really a gift that, that, Dave has, um, that Dave has given you, but it's, it's precarious, so it needs all of us. Yeah, be careful, be careful they're not compiling a dossier on us for attending this session. They might be. They, they are. Believe me, each one of us that protests anything at John Jay, just like Stanley got kicked out of the deep for, you know, protesting the dean's office, you can bet your bottom dollar that John Jay and every other CUNY school has, a, has some file on you the minute you squawk and make any noise. I know they do. They have security cameras all over here. And if you don't think they look at those, you know, I, I, I can testify otherwise. They definitely do. Well, I think you should do it anyway. Well, uh, that, I mean, our, our responsibility is to do it anyway. Well, I mean, the, now that we know surveillance exists, we have to do it anyway. We have to be... Given the way the federal government has made it so permissive to, to spy and collect data on everybody, everybody thinks it's okay. So our institutions are collecting, you know, I think an enormous amount of data about us and not telling us what it is that they've got in their files. And frankly, I'm bothered by that. You know, it's close to home now. Right? When it's, when it's Afghanistan, when it's Syria or something, oh, it's just them, you know? But when it's us, and believe me, they know and, and they share that information with others in the city as well. The NYP, if anything, if I get stopped for a traffic ticket, they call John Jay and let him, hey, your professor got stopped for a traffic ticket. If something happens here, they tell the NYPD, right? So there's a network of data sharers and they have information about us. We need our own Freedom of Information Act here. You know what I'm saying? And we don't have one. I wouldn't disagree, but I also think those of us, particularly who are tenured at public institutions, absolutely have a responsibility right now to speak aloud about these issues. A few years ago, when the PSC went up to Albany and a bunch of us agreed to get arrested as they were putting handcuffs on elderly ankles, what are these called, wrists, um, one, of the, uh, one of the cops whispered to me and I think to other people, thanks for doing this, thanks for speaking for public workers because we can't. So I think there's a kind of solidarity with other workers um, and some of us, it's, it's a rare privilege to, be a, to have a tenured position even if they're going to give us shit for And one of the things you want to think about 
you know, I believe there's one time around. And I'm, 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 I'm still in the, the, the one time. I have never hidden my po political point of view. If there's a demonstration, I can make it, I go. If there's an occupation and I can make it, I'll go. I write things, I say things. It's a way of life. Now, if activism is not a way of life, you, you begin to get scatter and scatter and scatter. But if activism is a way of life, then it becomes part of, the, of, the, of life. And if the cops got, got their number on you, one of our major problems is we don't have enough on the cops. And we don't have enough on the military. And we don't have enough on the large corporations that control the cops. So my, my, my dedication right now, and I respect everybody who does good work, but my dedication is I study up. Okay? And if you study up, you're exposing them, and not just them exposing you. Well, that's what I meant by you have to do it anyway. Okay, let, let me just say one thing. Secretive, though. Oh, well, you don't think what you're doing is secret. The goal is publicity. I always say when I'm attacked, as long as they spell my name right, thank That's you very right. much. <laughs> and the other thing is, I'm very, this is my 51st year of teaching. I have never given a test in my life. All I want is your opinion. All you have to do is write a good essay giving me your opinion, and you cannot agree with me because I'm off the wall. Um, so you have to give me your opinion. Bottom line, a lot of my students have said, you know, we're collecting this debt. Is it worth it? Is going to school worth it? And I have to say, it's only worth it if you dedicate the rest of your life to being an activist and living a very full life, just what Stanley said. I mean, this is the time around that you have this time. And for me, a real hero was a former chancellor, uh, associate chancellor, Julius C. C. Edelstein, who had a motto. And he was responsible, you know, I was really shocked when you said SATs started with open admissions because I didn't know that. But, but it was Julius Edelstein who said, if we're going to have open admissions, we have to have the SEEK program. Everybody has to be brought up to what they need to have. We'll have a SEEK program, and he introduced that. And his motto was, it's better for everybody when it's better for everybody, which seems to me a very good motto. OK, I think um, we're going to take a short break there and um, start um, with the uh, next panel, uh, which is um, distinguished professor Fran Piven. Um, Professor Louis Bardos, if he's here, and Professor Chuck Strozier. Um, Thank thanks you. so much for being here.